morning and happy Sabbath, Ecclesia Church family. We're so excited to have you all joining us on this morning. Uh, my name is Allison Jimenez, um, but before we jump into our worship word and prayer, I just wanted to quickly share with you this verse that's really been encouraging me this past week. It's found in Romans 8, 28, and it says, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I know for myself that living through this pandemic and through just these crazy times has not been easy. It's been really easy to um, to have anxiety and wor worry for my future and worry about um, what's going to happen next week or next month or even next year. But whenever I look at this verse, I just have so much confidence and so much assurance realizing that not only do we have an almighty God who loves us so much, but he is also working um, for the good of our future and for all things to work together. Um, and I just pray that y'all will also claim this verse as well and just have um, so much assurance that we serve a mighty God. But yeah, as we transition into our worship word and prayer, I just hope that you all will experience a confident gospel living. Two. Ecclesia family, another Saturday we get to get into the Word together. Now, before we get started, I want to address the elephant in the room, and that is this past week, we as American citizens experienced probably one of the most important days within our country's history, which is Election Day. That's right, Election Day just occurred a couple of days ago, and as of the recording of this video right now, we still are unaware of who has won the election, regardless of who you voted for, or maybe if you didn't vote at all. This has probably been one of the most anticipated and participated elections in American history. It's actually incredible. They are reporting that there have been multiple records being broken as to the participation. I mean, there's so many people invested. And if you just take a look online, people's reactions to what's been going on in this election process has been intense to say the least. Now, we have to ask, what about the Christian? The Christian's response to this, to all of what's going on. Now, I want to focus our attention to another type of race. You know, we're talking about the election race, and I know that's what's on most people's minds right now, but if you and I, we can just shift together just briefly for this, for this amount of time that I have with you. I want us to shift our focus to another type of race. Now, it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and I'm excited to get into the Word today because I think this is going to be very encouraging and maybe a refocus of priorities of what's been going on. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And before we get started, I want to pray with you. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I just thank you because in your word, we have all that we need. We have what we are equipped for for every single day. We have your truth, revelation of who you are. And so God, I ask that your word guide us in all matters of life. And if even if some things maybe not be explicit within your word, May we go to you as our primary source of direction. You above everything else. In your name we pray. Amen. So we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and we're going to be starting in verse 24. It says this, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. 
I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Now, if we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we find out kind of the whole intention as to why he's writing this letter. And we're going to unpack this imagery of running a race of Greek athletics at the time. But let's first go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we're going to be in verse 10 and we'll go back to chapter 9. Verse 10 says, I appeal to you, brothers. So this is how Paul is framing his whole letter. This is his motivation why he's writing this. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no division among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. I'll repeat that again. But that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. You know, when we look at the, the geographical map of the U.S. and in relation to the election, this has to be one of the most divisive elections we've seen in modern politic history. There are slight margins being debated right now, different regions flipping, not flipping, expectations being upturned. And so I read this with the understanding that right now it seems to be that the culture at large within our nation is one of polarization. In other words, there's a difference of opinions. And it seems to be very split in the middle. Now, what Paul is referring to when he's writing this letter in 1 Corinthians is that he's making an appeal that the believers in the church of Corinth be of the same mind, of the same judgment. We find in other passages that when Paul is writing about the mind, he talks about surrendering your mind to Christ. In other words, when we go to Christ and we commune with Him, there is a transition in our relationship that we go to Him and say, God, please renew my mind, change my habits, change my way of thinking so that I may look more like You. This is what Paul refers to as the renewal of one's mind. It's when the power of the Holy Spirit takes your mind, starts to form it more into the likeness of Him who made you. Why? So that you can then manifest His glory and His love. And so when Paul's writing this, he wants the church to be of the same mind, the mind of Christ. Because if we are of the same mind, then we will most likely be of the same judgment. See, those two go hand in hand. When we commune with the Father, the Father will bring us into the truth and we agree on that truth. This is why in Hebrews it talks about how us as believers shouldn't disband, disband the practice of coming together. Why? So that we can edify each other in a love, stirring each other up in good deeds. Let's come into one mind, the mind of Christ, so that we can be of one judgment. Now, Paul is not referring to that we think exactly the same on all things. That's not what Paul is referring to. Unity does not necessarily mean uniformity. But what Paul is saying and why he's writing this letter is that he wants to see the believers agree on the truth, the essential truth of who Christ is. If we can't agree on that fundamental premise, then how can we serve? How can we reach? How can we see lives transformed as believers ourselves within a community? We have to agree. We have to be of one mind. Now, as we move forward in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we, write in, we see in this chapter that Paul is describing this process of how he is laying down his rights. You know, let's read verse 19. It gives us a good context of us going into 24. It says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, 
that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. Verse 21, To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all people, and that by all means I might save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel, that I might share with them in its blessing. So Paul's describing that I'm free in Christ, but with my freedom, I actually make myself a servant to those who need to be served. So what he's trying to say is that I give up my freedom for the sake of reaching others. Why? So that I can bring those to the feet of Jesus. So I can see lives transformed by His gospel, by the good news of Jesus Christ. I love the spirit that Paul is speaking from. It's a spirit of servitude. It's one that's willing to see beyond opinion. It's one that's willing to go beyond what people would designate as this has to be the way to serve someone. Paul goes outside of those boundaries. Why? Because he knows that there are different ways to reach different people. And at the end of the day, we as believers have been commissioned to reach those for some of those for some of us that might look like going out into impoverished communities and reaching those who have lower resources than us for others it might be connecting with affluent people and still relating to them the gospel and the necessity of who Jesus is beyond material wealth one mission field is not more important than another. I learned this when I had went, when I went to uh, serve as a student missionary in the field of Denmark. Now, Denmark is considered to be one of the wealthiest, most stable countries within the world. Now, their government system is one that allows for a lot of social mobility a safety net as you will, but Denmark also has one of the highest amounts of atheism or agnosticism of unbelief within the world. And so it is considered to be by many one of the hardest places to reach people. Why? Well, the basic premise is this, is that why would I need God when I have everything that I need? That's a unique challenge and fundamentally different to other areas within the globe that maybe not have as many technological or material resources as, 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 as us. There are different needs for different people, but I believe the same truth is the same, that we all are in need of Jesus, regardless of who you are, where you come from. Scripture tells us, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Why? So that all may have eternal life. Now, if we continue here, verse 24, it says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. And this is the meat of our passage today. Now, when Paul is referring to a race, he's referring to the Isthmian Games. Now, there were four major Greek games, and those four games would happen at different times, some two, every two years, some every three years. Well, the Isthmian Games happened one year before the Olympic Games and one year after the Olympic Games. So it was every two years that these games would happen. And these games in particular, the Isthmian Games, were the second most popular games, only next to the Olympic Games. So if you won one of these games, you would gain national recognition, wealth, fame, something similar to when you win a game, uh, an Olympic game for today. Now, there are different categories in these games. Of course, running, as most of us know, 
javelin tossing, even singing. Yes, singing was a game. Wrestling was another type of game that you would participate in. All these different categories to signify the utmost pinnacle peak of human endurance of physicality. But what's important about knowing about these games is that every time the Isminian games would occur, they would start the ceremony with an offering to the Greek god of Poseidon. That's right, they would start the offering to the Greek god of Poseidon. And so this game was a paganistic type of game. Now the question is, why is Paul using the imagery of a pagan game? I would like to offer that he's using it because he's preaching to the church in Corinth. The Isthmian games occurred in the area of Corinth. And so when Paul's writing about these games, they would have been familiar with what he's talking about. They would immediately have grabbed towards the imagery. They would have grabbed the imagery and ran with it. Why? Because Paul is using what the people know. He's using an existing framework to reappropriate it for the glory of God. It goes back to this idea that I will be a servant to all. I'll use what I can for the glory of God. Obviously not to compromise who He is. And we're going to talk about that actually. Because we don't serve to the point of compromising who we are in Christ. That's not what Paul's saying. But he uses this imagery of a race. Now, for those that have participated in races, there was an extensive process. You could be training up to 10 months for this race. And there was rigorous training occurring. Strict diets, different types of materials and equipment used to optimize training going to local gymnasiums. And a racer was not just one individual. They were not just one individual that would just run the race. Much like in modern athletics today, it's not just the competitor that is behind in this race. But there is a slew of dynamics. To run in these races, you had to have some level of affluence or commitment. You had to have some sort of family that would be able to support you financially. As a racer, you were training constantly, training constantly, day in and day out. So you would need some source of income to allow you to continue to train. Not only that, but you would need coach. You would need a coach to help you train. You would need qualified people to give you direction as to the best way to train. And this is interesting because coaches were just as important as the ones competing within the races. I want to read you a quote by a historian or a writer of history. Her name is Heather Voigt and she writes this, Coaches remain an important part of an athlete's training to this day. But in ancient Greece, a coach who trained a winning athlete was revered and received equal credit for his students' accomplishments. Most coaches were former athletes who not only instructed an athlete at, on his sport routines, but also focused on diet, hygiene, and physical therapy. In other words, if the racer won, then the coach would receive just as much recognition. Now, if you, as an upcoming racer, are so curious and wanting to compete into these races and win, you're going to go with the coach who is nationally recognized. We see this in modern sports today. We hear of great soccer coaches that switch to clubs, and there's huge celebrations. Why? Because they believe that in the hands of a right coach, you can take a team to its peak performance. Same thing with basketball, baseball, football. Coaches are important. Why? Because they bring the best out of their athletes. It's the same way with you and I. We go to our coach because we believe that he can bring the best out of us. 
day in and day out. God is training us. He's equipping us. Know your coach. Know Him. Go to the coach. He's strengthening you. He's encouraging you. He's wanting you to run with endurance. It's easy to run and get excited. It's easy to get excited about a ministry when it starts. Yes, we're going to do this. It's easy to get excited about a new opportunity, maybe at work. It's easy to get excited about a new relationship that you might have, whether it be romantic or friendship. It's easy, it's easy to get excited. It's easy to start a race. It's much more difficult to continue to run the race. We need a good coach. Sure, can we run the race alone? Yes, if we have to. But the Bible doesn't call us to run alone. The Bible calls us to encourage one another, edify each other, especially with what's going on in the world today. Please do not stop reaching out to one another. Regardless of the difference of opinions, reach to one another, engage one another, pray for one another. That's what we were called to. If we can't even pray for our, for our brothers and sisters in Christ, how much more are we going to pray for those outside of the faith? This whole idea of running the race was a spectacle. People would come every two years, fill out the stadium to watch someone run the race. And church, I do not want to see us be spectators. We weren't called to just fill a seat and watch a few people stream online and preach the Word. Don't be a spectator. If you're going to run, be a sprinter. Because it's easy to spectate. It's easy to criticize the athlete that's running. It's easy to say, oh, they could have done that, or they should have done that, or they should have said that, or they shouldn't have said that. But you and I are going to be accountable to Him. And we have to ask ourselves the question, are we spectating or are we sprinting? Paul says at the end, I discipline my body and keep it under control. Lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. You know, he's talking about the flesh. He's talking about disciplining his body. He doesn't want his sensuality, his flesh to speak on behalf of him. Lest it disqualify him. More than ever, church, Guard your heart. Guard the intimacy of your life. Because there's a lot of things people aren't seeing. There's a lot of things going on in the dark. And I don't know what you do in your spare time. And you don't know what I do in my spare time. All I know is that I have to be accountable to Him. I have to be accountable with my conscience every single day. If I don't tend, if I don't train as this imagery is implying, if I don't go to my coach, if I don't seek him, if I don't sing songs, if I don't read the word, if I don't pray my prayers of surrender to him, making me more like himself, I will start to let my sensuality run the race. And I am not going to let the flesh disqualify me. You know, when Paul's referring to this imperishable prize, he's not talking about heaven. And I think as believers, we have have heard the rhetoric so much that the prize is heaven, right? That's our prize. After all the trials and tribulations, the prize is heaven. I want to I wanna tell you that I strongly disbelieve that the prize is heaven. It's not about us going to heaven. It's about heaven getting back into us. And as Paul firmly says, I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. He doesn't want to be disqualified. He doesn't want his flesh to discourage other people. Why? Because preaching allows other people to experience the gospel. So the prize isn't that 
I get to go to heaven. The prize is that heaven gets back to me. We testify on that truth and someone then can see heaven in us and see the Father so that they may enter into communion with Him and then receive heaven into them. The presence of the Holy Spirit itself within our lives. That's the prize. Yes, I understand there is a lot going on right now and this year has just been one thing after another. But at the end of our life, when we see Him face to face, are we going to say, well, God, um, I, just, I just didn't practice my faith. I just didn't run the race because of COVID-19, of because certain uh, election results, uh, because someone was rude to me online. No, we're not going to say that to Him because all excuses fall to the wayside in the presence of our Father every single day. Go to the coach and ask him to crucify your flesh. Put off the old man. Put off old habits. Are you a spectator or are you a sprinter? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, regardless of what ends up transpiring with the election, regardless of what 2020 has to bring with us at the end of the year, Regardless of everything else, we run the race with you. And God, I pray for those who feel isolated, who may feel discouraged. May true believers reach out in this time, encourage one another, pray for one another. May we be diligent in our time with you. Continue to train us so that when we are glorious in our race. It's not because of us, but it's because of you. And all fame and glory and credit goes to you, our coach. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, Ecclesia. I hope that you were encouraged by this message. And regardless of what happens, I know one thing for sure. He has already won the race in our life. So let's continue to run with him. Take care and God bless. Stay confident in him.
beautiful message we had today. Very inspiring. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for your marvelous, marvelous teachings through your word. Thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit and the presence of your holy angels. We know that running the race of our lives require a hard work, requires self-denial, self-discipline, require a purpose. Help us not to be expectators, but rather the runners the run towards the heavenly reward, which is the crown of life, that crown that will last forever. Help us each and every day of our lives so we can pray more, so we can study your word more, so we can be those excellent winners for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you again for joining us this morning. We really pray that you were blessed by the service and that it will continue to encourage you for the rest of the week. For more content, you can follow us on social media platforms of Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and even TikTok at Ecclesia Paris. And we want to thank you again just for joining us. And we just want to pray a blessing over you guys um, this next week. And have a happy rest of your Saturday.